Good morning and welcome to worship at Polk Street United Methodist Church. We're delighted that you're worshiping with us today. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 52. So I'll invite you to get your Bible and get that passage out so you can be prepared to follow along when that time comes to read scripture. As always, let us know how we can be praying for you and we extend to you the opportunity to support this broadcast. You can do that either in memory or in honor of someone that you love. But now, dear friends, let's prepare to encounter a living God and give praise to the one who walks with us in all of life, Jesus the Christ. Good morning and welcome as we come together this morning in the spirit of Christ to worship, to give thanks, and to offer God's praise. It's a delight to be with you, and it's always good to encourage one another in grace. And so this time together uh, provides us with that opportunity. Pastor Burt's uh, tour of the Holy Land without packing your bags. You can come to that. Um, we had a great crowd on um, Wednesday night, had to bring in chairs, and so um, we can always make room for one more. So come on down. And then you'll notice that there are other midweek uh, classes that will be offered beginning in September. Um, Pastor Kevin is going to help you uh, know about visiting the homebound and those who are in the hospital. Um, so if you want to participate in that or in any other of the one-time Wednesdays, please sign up. Now, if you will, bow with me for a word of prayer. O oh, Holy One, we pray for your presence among us today. Where there is fear, bring comfort. Where there is doubt, grant hope. Where there is joy, give generosity. Where there is regret, bring forgiveness. And where there is pain, let us know your compassion. We trust in you, O Holy One. And so fill this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit and fill us too, that we may know you and love you and serve you in the week to come. Bless us now as we worship and bless your word as it is proclaimed, that it may take root and grow in our hearts. Amen. Now, if you will stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. Good morning, church. What a joy it is to see you all in worship on this beautiful day. Don't forget to check in on Facebook. Let folks know where you are. If you're watching from home on our live feed, we're glad you're with us today. In the pew back in front of each one of you is going to be a card that looks just like this. It's going to have two questions on it. I'm going to invite you during the worship time to fill out those questions and there is a basket at the visitors table you'll put your answers there i'll compile all the answers our long-range vision team is looking to where does the church want to be in five years 10 years and 15 years in the future so we're asking you two questions i ask you to answer those questions and place them there and we'll compile all that and i'll share that with you next week about all the information i failed to do one thing and that is at the early service I was surprised at how many people actually filled the card out, and I'm a little bit nervous at how many people will fill it out at this service, too. If the Lord puts on your heart to help out Pastor Burt with this idea to help me compile all these things, um, you would be greatly rewarded in heaven, not on earth, but in heaven. So, <laughs> but if you know how to simply take cards and you've got time to compile all the answers and type them into format, please see me afterwards, and I will be eternally grateful. Our opening hymn of faith is number 60. I'll praise my maker while I breath. Let us lift our voice in praise to God together.
seated. It is so wonderful to see all of you today. And everybody's still coming on down. Keep coming on down. I have something today that you may or may not recognize. You probably don't recognize it. You know what that is? Hmm? Anybody have an idea what that is? What do you think it is, Asher? It has something to do, nope, doesn't have anything to do with the car, but that's a very good guess. Something you spin like this, okay? I'm going to give you a hint. You ready? It's a crank for the car. That's a very good guess because that's exactly what it looks like, doesn't it, right? What it actually is, is a non-electric drill. And so what you do is you spin this, and you put the little drill bit in there. You see how the teeth kind of close? And it captures the drill, and then you put it down like this. It holds it in one spot, and you drill the spot. Now, the reason this is so very important to me is that this belonged to my grandfather. Now, it just looks like a regular thing, but it's really important to me because it connects me with my grandfather. I've got a couple of his old tools. He was a woodworker. So it's very valuable to me because of what it represents to me. And in the Bible passage today, Jesus talks about things being valuable. There are lots of things that are valuable. One of the most valuable things is not this kind of stuff. It's what it represents. It's the relationship. Friends. We come to church. We worship God. We talk about our relationship to God and faith in Christ and our friends that we have in church. Those are really, really important to us. Those are valuable things. And so we, we make sure that they, they're taken care of and we take care of our friendships. And I have lots of things in my office that remind me of people. And it's not necessarily the item, the thing. It's what it represents and reminds me of is my relationship with my granddad. And I've got a couple pictures of them. Some of you may remember seeing those pictures. When you hear the scripture today, Jesus is going to talk in a couple of different parables about why things are valuable and how they're valuable. So listen closely to see what you can learn today about what it means to follow Christ and to know how important it is to be a part of what God wants us to do in this world. So we're going to pray together. And will you pray after me? Dear God, God, thank you you. for always loving me. me. Help me me. to love others others. like Jesus loves me. me. Amen. Amen. All right, return to your seats. As we pray together this morning, I direct your attention to the insert in your bulletin where our prayer concerns are listed. And now, if you will, bow with me in prayer. O gracious and holy God, your love is stronger than suffering and your glory is greater than death. We give you thanks that you came in Christ Jesus to be among us, to share our suffering and our sorrows, our joys and our blessings. Christ gave up his life to show us that love is the only way to live. Too often, however, we fail to see that your love is the only real thing, the only thing that matters, and we seek after success. We seek after our own glory rather than seeking yours. 
And so forgive us on focusing on ourselves and our desires and turn us around. Set us on a path that will honor you and benefit our neighbor and cause us to grow in grace and find that peace that passes all understanding. We thank you for that amazing grace that has the power to transform all that is. Bless us, O Holy One, and bring us to that place where we are able to comfort those who suffer so that they may know your grace and love. Today, this morning, we pray for all of those who are caught in the storm and the remnants of it. We pray for those who are far from home and have no home to return to. We pray for those who have lost businesses and churches and favorite places. We pray for those who are still waiting for storm to pass. Grant strength for the days ahead. Bless each person and each community to be strong in their love for one another. We pray too for those who are caught in storms of a spiritual or emotional or physical nature. Grant them too wisdom and strength for the days ahead. We offer to you now the prayers of our hearts and bless us as we pray together with one voice as Christ has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Many of you have seen what's happening in the area south, uh, east, and Houston, and Galveston, Corpus Christi, Rockport. It's terrible in that area. The United Methodist Church will respond. On our church Facebook page, I've already posted a little bit of information from the Texas Annual Conference that is also a geographic area of the Rio, Texas Conference. The United Methodist Church will have a response. The worst is yet to come in the flooding for the Houston area. It's anticipated that this could be the greatest humanitarian natural disaster because of the density of population and the flooding that is yet to come. Don't know exactly what that's going to look like. If you have a desire to give today, that's fine. You can open up the app, the church app. You can give. Just mark your giving Harvey Relief. Harvey Relief. If you want to wait a couple of days to find out exactly what we're going to be doing, that's fine as well. We'll be able to donate that. But if you give, 100% of what you give will be directed towards either UMCOR or the work in the Texas Annual Conference or the work in the Rio, Texas Conference, specifically for flood relief efforts. Because when we give to UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, 100% of what is given goes to relief. Let's also keep in prayers both today and tomorrow, all those in the Houston area. Our daughter and son-in-law are fine. They're on the second story of an area outside of a bayou. We check on them hourly. They're still okay. The neighborhood we moved from is about to flood. And they're going to probably have three to four feet of water in all the houses. And so we have friends there. You've got friends, I'm sure, in the Matagorda, Port Aransas, all that area in Rockport. We just need to keep our friends and all of our family members in our prayers. As the ushers come now to receive this morning's offering, I want to thank you for all the ways that you respond in wonderful ways and remind you that following worship today, if you'd like to wander down to see the renovated, completely renovated infant nursery area, please do so. This will be the last week that you'll just be able to wander down the hallway as code access will be required for the entire nursery area beginning next Sunday. Receive the offering now for God's people. May God bless it to the work and the image of Christ both in us and through us. <clears throat>
let the congregation be seated for a moment before we move to the scripture. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 53. And I'll invite you to, oh, we don't need that. We'll just preach shorter today. And the choir said? Amen. Some of them already heard it once. We often come to passages and texts and we just read them without thinking about the context. And so there are a series of short parables that Jesus is offering in Matthew chapter 13. We've already looked at several of those parables. Parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the yeast, the parable of the weeds and the wheat. We've looked at those and now we're going to move into the closing part of Matthew 13 and several parables are told in a sort of compacted form. As you think about all those individuals in uh, places from Padre Island all the way to Houston that are being flooded, and if you've ever had a crisis in your own home, you'll know that the most prized possessions are not the things that are most easily replaced, but those things which remind you that have sentimental value, something of deep value. And so if you know that something's going to happen or you have something that is of great value, you tend to take great care of it. And this is sort of the theme that's moving within the parables of Jesus in this 13th chapter of thinking of the kingdom of God as something that is of great value. Now, the reality is that for most people in the world, and even for some of us, when we talk about the kingdom of God, it's just an option of values to live by in a world filled with things that are at your disposal. It used to be, back in the day, and some of you will remember this, that what is now the Child Development Center was built in the 1950s. It was the gymnasium and the social hall. I can't tell you how many people I see say, I remember sleeping in the social hall at Polk Street when we went to so-and-so and so-and-so place. Back in the day, we could leave a key under the mat and church groups would get the key out, open up the door, sleep on the floor, and then they keep going. We can't do that anymore. But that building was built years ago in response to the environment in which the church found itself. Namely, people went to church to establish social relationships. It was a given that you went to church. It was part of the fabric of your value system. And when you went to church, then you established the social system. Kids that live close by, groups that you play cards with and have dinner with. But what happens today is that there's so many options for people to connect. And people can do that. They really don't need the church to connect anymore. So the nature and the character of who we are today is vastly different than what it was when the, building, the old buildings were built 60 and 65 years ago. So what is the nature of the church? What is the purpose of the church in the world? Well, we come to this place, and we come to be encountered and confronted and comforted by a word of grace from God's Scripture, a word that challenges us to ask a simple question, how is the transforming power and love of Jesus Christ working in my life? And as I've said to you many times before, I'll say again, nobody's life is going to be changed because you came to church. But everybody's life can be changed in the world if you are the church in the world, the body of Christ in the world. So the nature of who we are as church is changing in the sense that it used to be you always just came to church to do church. It's not going to work for transforming the world any longer, my friends. It just won't work that way. We have to be the church in the world. We have to be willing to come to this place and treat it like a pep rally. I mean, and how about that choir today? I mean, every Sunday they're awesome, but wow. I mean, I'm ready to change. Yeah, give them a hand. They do a great, great job. Most every Sunday that our choir sings, I'm ready just to charge the gates of hell with an empty bucket. They're just really, it's, you know, something about the songs of faith, the scripture, the sacred symbols of this place remind us that God is with us. It is our pep rally, if you would. It's our way to get infused together and say, we're going to move into the world and make it a different place. We're going to stand in the places where there's broken and racism and hatred, and we're going to bind up people and bridge the gaps and meet the people in need. That's what it's got to be. That's the nature of the church for us today. And so as we move through this passage, I ask you this question, what do you value? What are you searching for? Maybe some of you saw the news reports 
in June, a man named Paris Wallace, who was a grandfather and a pastor out of Colorado, left his home in January of 2017 to go into the New Mexico wilderness to look for a treasure that a man said was two million, worth $2 million. Now, when I read this article, the first thing I thought was, why did his wife not report him missing for three months? <laughs> Just saying, there's another issue in this article. But his body was discovered in June. Six months, he lost his life looking for a treasure. You and I lose a lot looking for treasures. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I bet a few of you out there might have gone and bought a lottery ticket last week when it was $700 million, right? You thought, well, just if. Look, all I prayed was, Lord, if that's a Polk Street, you're just reminding 9% is as good as 10%. <laughs> you know, we value things, but where do we put that value? We tend to let culture establish that our values and our possessions and what we have, and then those are the things that we value and possess, and those are the things that tell us what we're worth. It's the wrong way. Today, we've got to be encountered by the Scripture to understand it's got to start from the Scripture. We've got to find our value in what God prioritizes in life. And then we've got to make some choices about what we do with who we are. And so in that spirit, I want to unpack for you, after we read the Scripture, some of the meanings that may have been behind these, because it'll sound a bit odd. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to sound real easy. Oh, yeah, someone finds a treasure. Well, that's great. Someone finds a, curl, a pearl. That's wonderful. You're even going to think that's fine with the nets. Don't miss. As Jesus always does, there's a little bit of ooh in his parables. It's not only the grace, but there's also a sense that we may be justified by faith, but we are judged by our fruitfulness. We're justified by faith. That's biblical. It's in Romans. We are judged by our fruit. It's biblical. It's throughout the New Testament. By a, you should know a tree by its fruit. And then Paul says we should bear the fruit of the Spirit. And that Spirit, my friends, I invite you to stand as you're able. And let us listen to the words of Jesus found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 52. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And now he's looking at the disciples and Jesus says, have you understood all these things? Yes, they replied. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and as you are, let us pray together. May your spirit, O God, stand between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together will be shaped, formed, and molded into the good news of the gospel of Christ, in whose name we've gathered, in whose name we pray, and in whose name we will depart and seek to serve faithfully. And all of God's people did say, Amen. I once saw a sign in a mall at a place that was doing haircuts, and it said, free haircuts. And when I responded to that, I had a friend who also said, it's never going to be free. If you get a free haircut, you're going to pay for it one way or the other. But it's often something we say with our culture. Something's of value, it's purchased. And sometimes things that aren't valuable 
are totally free. But where do we place value? We place value on what something is or isn't, not based on the values of the world around us, but based on how Scripture helps us understand. So we're going to look today, and I'm going to make several statements. I want to be, I want to be just crystal clear as I can. When we're talking about things that you value, it's not the things, it's not the possessions that I'm talking about. When I refer to what you value, I'm talking about what's important to you and how you make your decision making, your gifts and your abilities. Because when we launch into this text, the first thing we have Jesus telling us about is that, that there was a man who was in a field working and he found a treasure. He hides it, he goes and buys the whole field. You see, we didn't have really a Jerusalem National Bank. And the most common people in Jesus' time, when they had something of value, they would bury it because it was a safe place where it couldn't be seen. After all, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus criticizes the one servant who did what with his talents. I knew that you were a just and righteous man, and I was afraid. Therefore, I buried my talent. Didn't put it to work. We know from Flavius Josephus, a Jewish Roman historian from the first century, he's recorded as saying that when people of Jewish heritage during the time of Herod the Great's conquest knew that the armies were coming, they would take the things that they valued and they would go and they would bury them so that when the raiding armies came, there would be the most valuable things would be hidden and buried. And then if they survived, they would later go back and they would dig up the treasures. I mean, after all, every one of us has a known. If you find a treasure trap, X does what? Marks the spot. And what's the spot? It's where the treasure is. Well, this is how it was in Jesus' time. People took what was valuable to them and they buried it. And so the first part of this parable is what Jesus is saying is, if you find something of value, the kingdom of God is like discovering a treasure. And the question is, what are you willing to give for that treasure? Because everything has a price. And there's a price for everything. To do nothing carries a price. To take proactive steps carries a price. There's something to adjustment you have to make in your life. And the kingdom of God is wherever God's will is fully present, and to be in the kingdom is to do God's will. So there's sort of a, a, a complementary effect here that the kingdom of God is wherever God's will is present, and whoever's present in the kingdom of God is doing God's will. So when you and I find those moments of doing God's will in this world, what are we willing to give up to accept the will of God and the kingdom work in this world? Are we like one who's found a treasure? Are we willing to give up some things and stuff in exchange for being a part of what God's kingdom desire is in this world? So the first parable is about what the value is, but the second parable is about a man who finds a pearl of great price. We know from historians as well that beautiful pearls were used as currency. They were as good as gold in Jesus' time. And so a man finds a pearl. Well, if you know anything about pearls, pearls are not all the same. Each one is unique. Some pearls have imperfections. But then there's that beautiful pearl, and I think that Jesus is inviting us to know that there is something absolutely beautiful about God's kingdom. Somewhere along the way in churchy language, I think that we tend to adopt a philosophy that says, well, if I really come to life in Christ and give my life to Christ, uh, then I've got to give up this, I've got to give up that, I've got to abandon this, self-denial. I mean, after all, Jesus said, deny yourself and take up your cross. And so we think that this sort of a, it's sort of a drudge to do the religious thing. I think Jesus is telling us there's something beautiful that happens when God's kingdom breaks forth into this world. It's beautiful. Look, I, saw, I see it all the time when, when, when we do things in this world that are so contrary and unexpected. It's a beautiful moment. It can be as simple as offering a bottle of water to someone on Polk Street during one of the major events who's never encountered the church. But what they did encounter was a person of grace to something as deeply significant as watching what happens when we take food to snack pack for kids or reach out in mission work or heal the city. It's amazing what happens when we choose to participate in what God is doing in the world. And it is a beautiful thing. But it comes the price. We can't keep doing everything that makes us comfortable. 
and convenient and participate in God's kingdom. Being a part of God's kingdom is doing God's will. And quite frankly, there's some things that each of us does that do not reflect God's will in this world. We harbor biases, we hang on to hurts, and we don't always prioritize our lives like we need to. But Jesus says not only is the kingdom of God wherever God's will breaks in is something of value, it's also something beautiful. So I'm asking you, what are you willing to accept? What are you willing to give up to accept what God does in this world? And then they're really easy parables, aren't they? I mean, now we're talking about a net. Jesus said the kingdom of God's like a net. It's cast down. It brings up all kinds of fish. Probably speaking, the Sea of Galilee were over 120 different species of fish were. Some fish were fish that would be kept. Some fish, actually, it's kind of odd because if it was a keepy fish, they would actually probably put it in a basket, but that basket would be within the water to keep the fish alive because they need to keep the fish as live as long as possible to transport it to market. But the reality is there'd be a sifting that would take place. And so there's this tension that happens in this teaching of Jesus about the net and the sorting. I think the net is that, you know what? We're all welcome here, and we're all part of God's kingdom work. But just because you're welcome doesn't mean that everything you're doing is God-blessed and God-endorsed. Every one of us has that part of our life that least reflects the will of God, least reflects how we were created to be and designed by God. And so we come to this place knowing that there is as much grace as there is confrontation of our journey in humanness. When we let that image we were created and slowly get marred by all the outside influences. But what's real clear in this text is we need to remember there is a time of judging that's coming. There is a time of sorting that's coming and it's unavoidable in many ways. Because oftentimes, especially as Methodists, we are, hey, we, we love grace. We sing about grace. And I agree with grace. But grace alone only makes sense in the context of some sense of a boundary in judgment. Because if it's only grace, it's just sentimental. And if it's only judgment, it's condemnation. But within that tension, it begins to make sense. And I think Jesus is inviting us into that uncomfortable place where we ask those questions, what do we really value? What is really beautiful to us? And what are we willing to give our life to? So now we come to the card I ask you to think about. Now, I'm not asking you to think, oh, I've got to change my answers. You know, I'm, okay, I, I, I do. I really want to know. What do you want the church to do for you? And what do you want the church to do in the world? And the reason I'm asking that is twofold. The first is, as our long-range vision team takes these collective answers and begin to look to the future, we're saying, where does the church need to be building God's kingdom in this world in the next 5, 10, and 15 years? We need to hear from you. Where are you? I want to promise you two things. If I get a card and I list the ideas and you say, well, this church ought to start a such and such, I want you to know that I have an unwavering conviction to this simple concept. If you think this church should start it, then God's put it on your heart to help it get started. I don't need, and we don't need, 100 different, 50, 150 different opinions about what somebody else ought to do. But what I want to do is collectively see together what you want the church to do in your life, but I also want to ask, what do you want to see the church do in this world? And guess what? The church can only go and be what its individual members are willing to be and become. Hear that again. The church can only go and be what its individual members are willing to be and become. In other words, this is not going to be just a generated list of I hope somebody else will do it. What I want is a list of what are the dreams that God's put on your heart that we could look and say, how could we come together? How could we make these things be accomplished? Or do we need to step out in some venture and do something creative and new? And as we look at all these things, I promise you this, we will never become the church that God is wanting us to become if we are so married to doing everything the way it has been done and what we have been doing that we're not willing to say some things maybe were good for a season, but now this is what God is calling us to. But that's the tension. 
as an organization, it's the same tension you experience in your life. You like your routines. You like certain things. You get your coffee here. You get your tea here. You either like stevia, sweet, and low, or splenda. And that's what you're stuck with, right? And when they don't have one or the other, you get a little bit of, well, yeah. You like donuts from a certain place. Trust me, I've heard it from you, okay? <laughs> I've heard it. And that's not just because I've got a donut named after me in this town, okay? We have our habits and behaviors, but the question we have to ask is, do they reflect biblical values grounded in Scripture about what God calls us to be in this world? And then one of the most beautiful aspects of this passage can be perplexing. If you have your Bible, you can open it up. If you just want to listen, I'll read it to you. It's in verse 52. Jesus said, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. It seems perplexing at times, but what if we look at this through the lens of understanding that when Christ calls us, he doesn't call us to abandon all that we are, though there may be some parts of us that are incompatible with the footsteps of Christ, but we all come to Christ with gifts that we're not asked to give up, but gifts that we are willing to apply to God's kingdom building work. Scholars should not be asked to abandon scholarship and pursuit, but to apply that scholarship in living out the kingdom values, helping us dive into the historical significance and truth of scripture. Business leaders don't automatically give up their business, but could be asked this question, how can I align my business in a way that honors God's values and kingdom work in this world and do that? If you sing, dance, or paint, you don't, you're not called to abandon those gifts, but to think about how can you use those gifts for Christ? So in Jesus' teaching, he helps us understand there are things about God's kingdom which are brought into the life of the New Testament church out of the Jewish history that are not abandoned, but they're celebrated along with the newness that we see in who Christ is. So I ask you, what are you willing to give up to accept God's will for your life? What are you willing to give up to join in God's kingdom work? It's that simple. Some of the things that you have been gifted with, hang on to, because God created you with that ability. But some of those things that you've accumulated in habits and behaviors, maybe even some possessions, are beginning to get in your way of being able to say yes to what you put on the card. Many years ago, Elvina Hall was sitting in the church choir and she was overwhelmed as she sat there with a message of what God was doing in the world. She was sitting in the choir of Monument Methodist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. And they call it the flyleaf. I don't know if you're aware of that, but in the very front of a hymnal or a book, a flyleaf is in the binding that may have text in the back, but the flyleaf is blank in the front. And she had this overwhelming message coming to her heart and she had nothing to write on except the blank page at the front of her hymnal. And she grabbed the pencil and began to pen these words. Now she hadn't studied about it. She hadn't been on a mission trip. She hadn't gone to um, the Global Leadership Summit or out to Saddleback Church with Rick Warren. She hadn't heard any Stanley tapes. Those are all great, great things. But let me tell you, God can put something on your heart directly. And this is what God put on Elvina's heart. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We don't know what the pastor's response was when she walked up and handed the hymnal to him and said, I wrote in the book this morning. 
but she had scripted out all the verses you're going to sing in a moment. What she didn't know was that in that church, the organist John Grape, a couple of weeks previously, had come up with a melody that God put on his heart, and he had scripted it out and wrote, what do you call it when you do that, George? When you write music, he wrote the scores of music? Is that what it is? No, Paul? Yeah. So he wrote out the music, gave it to the pastor. So the pastor has this music and no words, and now he's got words and no music, and guess what happens? The two come together. Don't fail when God puts something on your heart. Never fail to act on it. Now, you may need to ponder and get counsel. You may want to look at not everything you think to do is God. Sometimes it's indigestion. Sometimes it's guilt. Right? No, seriously. Sometimes your guilt makes you make bad decisions. You haven't done anything whatsoever, and then you see something of need, and so you're going to overreact, and you may put yourself in a place that's not really safe or good. What I'm talking about is when you're in that place of your spiritual centeredness and God lays that on your heart, write it down somewhere because you never know when someone's given the music to one person and you've got the words. This church can only go. This church will only be in the world what you and I choose to be as followers of Jesus Christ. Bricks don't change lives, but they create the space for life-changing conversations to happen. The, what we know for sure is ministry moving forward is about moving into the world and meeting people where they are and living those words of the benediction from St. Francis Assisi, which I tell you every week, that when you leave this place, you're called to go preach the gospel to everybody that you meet and if necessary, do what? Use words. Let us pray together. God, your kingdom work is marvelous. It's mysterious. You know, sometimes, God, it's so easy to understand and it comes with absolute clarity. Other times, it's so challenging, it scares us. So help us uh, walk together as the body of Christ to lean upon one another, to, to listen to each other, to walk together, to strengthen one another. And when we leave this place, especially help us be able to recognize the things that are of value and importance to us. And as we move into the world to live faithfully what your scriptures teach us and call us to be as your kingdom people in this world. For it is in Christ's name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, join now if you turn to number 881, the Apostles' Creed. It reminds us of who we are and whose we are. It's a summary of the faith together. As you find that, I'll invite you to stand as you are able, that we might together join in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn of faith is Jesus Paid It All. It's the insert, uh, the second insert within your bulletin. The most important thing to us at Polk Street is that wherever you are on this journey of faith, that you're an active, growing disciple of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to talk about church membership, you can either come and join the church during the closing hymn of faith or speak to any of us of his church staff as uh, we depart today. Don't forget, there's a basket for your cards and your answers at the visitor's table at the back. Let's lift our voice and praise to God together.
upon some of your hearts, God is writing the melody and music. Upon some of your hearts, God has given the poem and language that becomes the music. So go forth in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Join God's kingdom work by preaching the gospel to everybody that you meet. And as you find it necessary, you may also use words. And all of God's people did say,